Welcome back, everyone, to the Men on a Mission podcast. I'm your host, Brad Richard, and shortly we will be starting our next episode. We will be providing you tools, resources, and information that you can use to make your life just a little bit better. But before we do that, let's honor our country, and then we'll begin the podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to the Men on a Mission podcast. I'm your host, Brad Richard, and this is episode 59. Uh, Today, I have a special guest with me, Larry Friedland. He is the author of the book, Chariots in the Sky. Uh, Larry was born in Canton, Ohio. Since his father was an officer with the United States Air Force, he grew up on many Air Force bases across this country. After graduating from high school at Ramey Air Force Base in Puerto Rico, he attended the University of Southern Florida in Tampa. He graduated in 1968 with a degree in mathematics and a concentration in finance. He joined the U.S. Army and served one tour in Vietnam with the 101st Airborne Division as an infantry officer and a CH-47 helicopter pilot. He is a recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross with one oak leaf cluster, the Air Medal with 10 oak leaf clusters, the Bronze Star, and various other military service medals. Awesome. Um, Wow, that's quite a resume, and that's only part of of what I read. So that's a little bit about uh, about Larry. And uh, yeah, welcome to the podcast, Larry. I wanted to start off if you can tell the listeners a little bit about um, your your backstory, I just gave them a little bit of it, but uh, tell us a little bit about you know you, uh, what you're doing now, and then in the second segment after our break, we will get into the book. So welcome to the podcast, and I'm going to let you take it from here. Well, thank you, Brad. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to join you this morning and uh, talk a little bit. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I grew up on air bases. My dad was a career officer. Uh, it kind of gave me a, a liking to pursue, possibly finish my formal education. And uh, of course, back then, uh, when I graduated in June of '68, uh, the Vietnam War was pretty much at its peak and been going on for a couple of years prior to that, going for many more. So basically, mostly all of the young men growing up back then of college, I mean, of draft age, 18 or older, were subject to the draft. And in most cases, if they didn't uh, volunteer, or go into the service on their own, they would have been uh, picked up by the Army and drafted. Uh, I graduated, as I mentioned, uh, and I had earlier that year applied to the, uh, for their flight training program, and I, I passed all their tests. I was sent out to McDill Air Base in January of 68 to do a flight physical, passed that, and uh, was accepted to the program. But they had such a backlog, I couldn't uh, start my OCS class, officer school, until October of that year. And if you successfully completed that, which was about a 12 week program, I believe, you would go on to flight school, as was the case with all us fellows. Our college, our draft boards was constantly uh, requiring we provide documentation at the end of each semester or quarter as to our college status. Well, I notified that I uh, graduated and that I had been accepted to the Air Force and was scheduled to start school in, in October. And the response basically was, well, that's fine, but you're going to draft you. So I was drafted in July of 68, went into the Army, 
sent the Ford Dix, New Jersey basic and advanced infantry training. AIT, part of the AIT, many of the guys in our company were college grads that were caught up in the same uh, draft situation I was. And they were constantly coming to us to offer us OCS, Officer Candidate School, and when doing things to entice us to do that. Uh, I figured at that time, as did many of the fellas, uh, well, you know, it's I think I'll do it. That's six months of training, and maybe I'll stay in the States for another six months. That's a year. And hopefully the war will be winding down, basically. So I went ahead and volunteered for OCS. I thought they only had three branches open at the time, infantry and armor. And uh, I figured, well, with math degree, maybe I'll get artillery, you know, using angles and figures and equations and all that stuff. Well, I was, it was, an, I should have known better, but anyway, I, it, I ended up with those, uh, with infantry as did everybody else. So uh, finishing up with uh, advanced training in November, and then we sent us to a, a four-week NCO preparatory school, and, and then went home for leave for a couple of weeks and showed up. I completed that. I was stationed at Benning for six months and uh, worked with ranger trainings and airborne training and uh, just general, uh, general projects as a newly commissioned second lieutenant. Uh, during that process of so about six months, I met and worked a little bit with a lot of helicopter aviators. And they basically said, you know, you're in the infantry, uh, we're going to fly, why don't you look at going into helicopters? Uh, if you go to Vietnam, which you will, of course, you'll, have a, you'll get a little bit, uh, have a little more flexibility. You could be in a bigger base camp, you're going to get some hot showers and some food and all, all those nice things. And if you're an infantry officer out in the bush, it's a little bit rougher. So I went ahead and threw my hat in the ring, got accepted, and in January of six, uh, 1970, I started my 11-month uh, training program as an aviator. Fort Walters, then Fort Rucker, and graduated after about nine and a half months. Everybody qualified, and of course, you got your wings. I was very fortunate at that time. Uh, I finished pretty high in my class and was offered an opportunity to transition into the Chinook, the CH-47, which I took, and uh, that was another two months of training. Got a couple of weeks leave in December, went home, and uh, then shipped out to Vietnam in January the 3rd of 1971. I spent the whole year of 71 in uh, with the, uh, up in I Corps with the 101st Airborne. We uh, we were stationed at what was called Phu Bai uh, Air Base. It was a base. It was an Army base, really, but it was a, a airfield with one major runway and most of the 101st aviation assets were stationed around that base a little north of us was what was called camp eagle which was the division headquarters and several infantry units there and then a little north of that was way and then a little north of that was the big base called camp evans another 101st uh, stronghold if you will that time in 91 had responsibility for the entire Northern uh, I Corps, pretty, which encompass Way, Fubai, the Ashaw Valley, Quezon, and then the demilitarized de zone. So we had quite a bit of territory. Unbeknownst to the fellows that joined or came in when I did that early part of January, uh, they have been planning a major operation, which we'll talk about later. It's uh, central to my book, but uh, they had planned an invasion into Lay American helicopter air support because the South Vietnamese, they didn't have any. Uh, any helicopter abilities they hadn't really been trained yet. we had been vietnamizing the war in, in 70 nixon president nixon wanted to turn the war with south vietnamese as quick as possible so they had started in earnest in 70 with infantry units and, and mechanized units but they really didn't get into the aviation aspect uh, much until the end of uh, 70 going into 71. so the bottom line at the time of this four months and ended up running only two months we the americans uh, provided them with uh, all their helicopter air support. And I'll cover that a little later. But af uh, after that ended, uh, the tour, the, I completed the rest of my tour there with the 101st and flew by and came back uh, in December, just a couple of days before Christmas, December of 71. I was signed for uh, at Fort Benning as uh, uh, one of the aides to the commanding general there at the post. Fly a little bit each month to get my minimums. I really didn't care too much about getting back in the cockpit for an extended period each month. I'd had quite a bit of flying for the past year and kind of wanted to just stay on the ground as much as possible for a while. So I was just, I was given the opportunity to work for the general, which I took, and it was a year and a half uh, working in that capacity. Really enjoyed that, thought I could really get used to this, but you, uh, you, you can't do that for your whole career. And I had just decided it was time for me to, to get out of the service and move on and pursue a discharge in um, September of 1970 and went into banking, which is one of the uh, industries I had thought I would enjoy. 
And I started out in Columbus, Georgia with the Trust Company Bank and moved on to Atlanta and uh, was with them for many years and then moved on to CNS Organization, which was headquartered in Atlanta. And then they went through a series of transitions uh, being required, merging and all those things. And then moved on to Wachovia, which ultimately got uh, merged and acquired. So about 28, almost 29, which I did. And then I moved into three years of consulting here in the Atlanta area where I live, uh, financial consulting. And then pretty much got tired of that. And so and I've always thought I'd like to be a teacher. So I, I piddled around with that for about a year. And I ended up being hired as an instructor at a, at a technical college for seven years, teaching their leadership and management uh, development programs. Really enjoyed that. And then took full retirement in six uh, at 65, doing a lot of traveling, community events. I've, I've supported veterans organizations and veterans activities really since getting out of the Army back in 73, but really stepped up my game about 15 years back and pretty much stayed active in that. And we have a, our oldest granddaughter, Elena, is 17, but she was born with cystic fibrosis. And we got involved in uh, the CF Foundation, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation really before the end of her first year. And then more recently, I uh, took to writing this first book, The Chariots in the Sky, uh, about two years back. It was, it was, I started on that. It was published in uh, April, May this year. And I've been busy uh, promoting that and uh, marketing some, some of that. And I've just recently finished uh, my second book, which will be going to the publisher here probably very shortly for the uh, editing process and all the things that go into ultimately getting your book published. And well, that's kind of uh, from graduation high school to my present. I live up in the North Georgia mountains and enjoy the area up here. And uh, my wife's a retired school teacher. We have two growing daughters and five uh, grandchildren, all of which uh, keep us kind of busy. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like it. Listening to your process and listening to um you know, your story as far as all the different things that you must have have experienced when you when you got out of the out of the military. Now, how long how long before the Vietnam conflict was over? Uh, were you in the States when they ended the Vietnam? Con- w- w- were you in the States when they ended the Vietnam conflict? Ah, uh, Yes. Uh- yeah, I was in, I think it was the summer of 1975 when uh, the uh, North Vietnamese overran the country and went into the palace there in Saigon and took it over. <clears throat> uh, and I had been out of, I'd gotten out of the service in September of 1973, so I'd been out about a year and a half or so. I can still remember, you know, of course they built, it, it all happened real quick. But the day that they actually rolled into the, the palace, that's when everybody knew it was totally over. I can still remember watching those news reports on TV and then, of course, seeing a lot of the news footage uh, of helicopters flying out of Vietnam to the various Navy vessels and carriers out out at sea there, dropping off their passengers and then rescued. So uh, you just kind of watch the whole thing melt in front of your eyes in a a matter of a couple of weeks and then in about a 24 hour period. So that was a little disheartening. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were here and watched. Well, I, I. I can't I can't imagine the things that that you saw and experienced Um, what you know if you feel comfortable with talking about your experience over there um, there's a lot of veterans that are going to be listening to this podcast that uh, were there also you know possibly not in the same position that you were but what Today, what is your general sense of that entire um, campaign? Um, what 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 are your feelings today? I mean, how how do you look at it going back in retrospect of the mission and uh, and the whole campaign as a whole? I know that's kind of a loaded question, but try to address that if you can. It's a good question. Uh, I get asked that a lot over the years, as I'm sure a lot of veterans do that talk about their experience or get questioned about any of it. Uh, what, I, had grown, I had grown up with the war. Let me give you a quick backstory. I mean, I, I graduated from high school in uh, June of 60, 1964 down at Ramey Air Base. And the year before I graduated, one of my friends, who was a senior the previous year, had gone into the Army, the 82nd Airborne. And, and uh, I didn't, we didn't know at the time, but shipped out to Vietnam. He was killed over there. 
And until we uh, got the news that he had actually gone and, and been killed, I really never heard of Vietnam. But from that moment on, that's all I heard. Well, not all, but heard a lot about it through my senior year. And then went off to college in 64, 65, my first year there. And it became a little more prevalent. Of course, I had to register for the draft when I turned 18. And by my sophomore year, the war was front and center on the news all the time. That would be 65, 66. And then the Vietnam War. And when I graduated, like I said earlier, at 68, I was uh, drafted into the Army. Uh, my feelings up until that point pretty much were keeping in mind I had grown up on, in, in an Air Force family. I knew a lot of uh, veterans. I knew a lot of uh, active duty. I thought I wanted to be a pilot. And I, uh, my, my personal heroes have always been uh, World War II veterans, particularly. I've known a lot going way back. Uh, but so I've always been around those kind of men. And I thought it would be, I'm getting called up. I need to go do what I need to do. But by the time 68 rolled around and it was my turn, so to speak, I had reservations. I wasn't a protester, really, but I had reservations about the war. I kept thinking, how can we be fighting over there and not really making a lot of progress? and not allowed to go after the enemy, which basically at that time was in the north, North Vietnam. Just the whole the whole strategy of the fight in the war, not that I would have been an expert by any stretch. So I had my doubts. Uh, went through all that training and then got to Vietnam. And when I arrived there, the, the war in Vietnam by then was very unpopular. You know, we had the uh, 68, 69 after Tet. Uh, the country was really starting to go up protest the war and the strategy and all those things. So it was by certainly by the time I got there, it was not a popular war. And, and the general public uh, had actually even turned against the men and, and the women that were over there serving. And we were the young people there to do what we were told to do and, and either end it or come back you know, and, and get on with our lives. So, uh, but by then my attitude was, Let's, we've wasted, that was 71, 72. I could, I had heard stories and you, um, before I got there, and really, you know, when you get there, you form your own opinions. You see, you see what's going on. Uh, but it was clearly uh, in '71. We had already started trying to turn the war over in '70, like I mentioned earlier. By '71, it was just how fast can we and get out and get out of the country. So it was a quick wind down. This this Lamson operation I'll talk about a little later. It was the first February and March. And uh, that was the last major operation of the war which the Americans fought in. We still had activity, but that was a major engagement. When I talk about that later, uh, I think it'll put that in a little more perspective. Uh, but coming out of that, I'm just speaking for myself. I thought these people, don't, these South Vietnamese, they just don't have the will to do it. I just don't think they're going to going to make it. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. um, can you kind of you know? So bring I came it back home. And, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, oh, no problem. I, I just I wanted you to kind of touch base on more current events. Um, how do you see our Afghan situation in comparison to Vietnam? When when we look at the Afghan situation, uh, pulling out of Afghanistan, and how do you see those two campaigns, um, the similarities and the differences? I just I'm interested okay. in in your take uh, on that. Well, quickly, and, my, my attitude. Yeah, then and then we'll take a break. Uh, we'll we'll take a break um, after we get that that perspective, uh, and then we'll come back uh, for the second part because we want to hear about your book. Okay. Well, real quickly, uh, over the years, my my attitude was I I thought we never should have gotten into Vietnam. I thought the Vietnamese just wanted to basically be their own country, be left alone. It, I wouldn't call it a civil war, but. I mellowed on it a little bit, but I did believe that eventually that country would become its own country, which it obviously has become. Uh, as I look at Afghanistan, uh, again, I didn't serve there. I have a younger brother who's gone now, but he served there one year and he served two two tours, 18 months each in Iraq. And from his perspective, which he shared with me a little bit, he thought the in the the effort in Iraq would probably pay off. That the, the Iraq seemed to have a little more stability and and uh, would eventually find their own and settle down a little bit. Didn't think our efforts would be a, a total waste. But in Afghanistan, his reaction was 180 the other way. He said, "There's we got no business being there. We're not fighting this right. There's no way we're going to win. Those people been their own people as 
forever and countries have continually tried to conquer them for whatever reasons and they just haven't done it and said we just should never be there so we didn't have any hope for afghanistan so our our getting out of there like eventually it was done as in my own opinion uh was was a shambles uh, there was no reason to just shut it down and pull out in the middle of the night uh, we should have uh, planned that out and stretched it out a lot more and given them a little bit of a chance because uh, from the news reports now, I do think uh, over there, there are still the pockets of people uh, in that country that would like to see their country be uh, basically left alone and independent and try and have a little bit of a stable life. Because I do think for all the years we were there, we probably infrastructures and so on, but that all came to a screeching halt when we pulled out of there basically overnight. So I, I see some similarities, but I also see differences. And I think maybe in retrospect, when we first went into Afghanistan to get bin Laden and did it, we should have probably just shut it down and got out of there instead of dragging it on for another, what, 15, 16 years? Mm -hmm. So, but the men and women who served there, um, as always, uh, uh, respect and support. Um, that was a tough city and, and kind of a little bit similar to ours. We didn't know in Vietnam uh, who the friendly people were, who the good guys were and the bad guys were regularly and uh, I think that was probably the same uh, situation in Afghanistan particularly and probably in Iraq too but particularly in Afghanistan so yeah it's uh it, it's a complicated topic um and I know a lot of uh, a, a lot of my brothers and sisters your brothers and sisters in the military are struggling with the recent uh departure from Afghanistan uh, and, yeah. and I know that that is uh, it's from a mental health standpoint, um, there's there's a lot of struggle right now, a lot of struggle right now with with Afghanistan and uh, remembering back to Vietnam and the thousands and thousands of uh, of people that we lost, uh, as well as people that were left behind there as well. And so uh, there are some parallels and it's part of our history that hopefully we can learn from going forward um, for sure. I, th I think this is a great place uh, to take a break and uh, we're gonna take a short sponsor break. And then when we get back, we are gonna continue speaking with Larry Freeland and he is the author of Chariots in the Sky. And when we get back for the second segment, we're gonna talk about his book, where you can get it, uh, why he wrote it and a little bit, uh, a little bit about the book. Uh, not too much because we want you to go ahead and uh, pick up a copy of this book. I think you would thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, Larry brings a perspective, uh, a seasoned perspective on things, I'm sure. And and uh, and we'll we'll cover the uh, the details on the book when we get back from a short break. So stay with us. You're listening to the Men on a Mission podcast. I'm your host, Brad Richard, and we will be right back. Welcome our new sponsor, Scars and Stripes Coffee Company. They empower veterans to build their own business using their e-commerce platform. When you purchase from Scars and Stripes Coffee, you are buying from a veteran, and your purchase directly impacts the men and women who have served our country. Do more than say, thank you for your service. Order today and empower a veteran. Use vet code Brad Richard at scarsandstripescoffee.com that's scarsandstripescoffee.com have you heard about anchor it's the easiest way to make a podcast let me explain first of all it's free they have great creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer anchor will distribute your podcast for you and it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many, many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you'll need to make a podcast in one place. Check them out and download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm to get started. Okay, we are back with part two of the Men on a Mission podcast. I'm your host, Brad Richard, and we are speaking with Larry Freeland. Um, he is a, uh, he's a Vietnam veteran, uh, helicopter pilot, and has uh, such a, a great backstory and, uh, and service uh, to our country. And he is the author of the book, Chariots in the Sky. 
So, Larry, welcome back to the podcast for our second segment. And tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, obviously, where did you come up with the title? And if you can tell us uh, a little bit about the book, uh, what uh, readers will find in it, and uh, kind of the goal for writing it, and and what message uh, uh, are you delivering uh, with that book? Certainly, I'd I'd be more than happy to. Uh, Going back in time, just briefly, uh, back in 19... 91 and 92, I wrote a screenplay based on my experiences as a historical fiction, and I tried to market that to Hollywood. Uh, Got three uh, production companies interested in it. They read my screenplay. They all liked it. One of them built more pictures, uh, uh, wanted to read it, was considering optioning it, it, and they take it up and down their uh, hierarchy, and took them a couple months, and they got back and said, well, we really liked it, but we have a war genre in post-production, and uh, we're going to pass on that. But you've really got a good uh, good screenplay here. You might want to consider turning it into a book. I had a lot of people during the writing of that and reading of that before I started marketing say, this would make a great book. Uh, and then after I went through all that for about two years and didn't, didn't get an option on it, it's kind of burned out, so I put it all away. But in the back of my mind, I always had this story that I wanted to tell uh, that I kind of carried with me. Since, since those days in 1971. And uh, about three years ago now, I got to thinking, well, Larry, you're not getting any younger. You're going to get the story out. You're down and write the book. Because between 90 through 93 until just before I decided to actually write it, I had several copies of my screenplay just lying around. And over the years, people that read it would always say the same thing. Larry, turn it into a book. So uh, I pulled all my paperwork out, my notes, and refreshed my memory a little bit, looked at the screenplay. And then going into the fall of 2019, I thought, I'm just going to sit down and start working on it, which I did. And then we come into 2.20 in February. Traction, of course, shows up and we lock down. I said, well, I'm not going anywhere for the next six or eight months, apparently, so I'll just take this and run with it. So I spent most of uh, 2020 writing the book. And when I was done, uh, I identified a couple of uh, publishers that were taking on uh, new manuscripts uh, if they were good or they thought they were good. And I contacted uh, two and both were interested, but published authority here in Atlanta and out in California uh, was really in the story and and saw a lot of potential in in it. And we ended up uh, signing a contract and working together and the book was actually published in the end of April of this year, in the May. It's available uh, on my uh, on five sites, and I'll come to that later. But it's been out there, and it's been doing quite well. I've been very gratified and pleased by the uh, the reviews I've gotten from individuals and organizations. Uh, most, not all, but many of them I've posted on my website. And there's a, starting to get more under reviews under it because that's where one of one of the locations you can you can buy the, the book and paperback or an ebook, Kindle. But let's talk a little bit about the story. Uh, Chariots in the Sky. It's a historical fiction book. Uh, the, the unit, the 101st, uh, the the uh, Operation Lamson, which I'll cover in a minute. Uh, the uh, the area we flew around in, the fire bases, many of the. Uh, took a uh, combat action or operations we flew on were based loosely on historical uh, actions, if you will. My characters are all fictional, obviously, as historical fiction. And I wrote the uh, main character. His name is Captain Taylor St. James. He's called TJ. I built him as a, what I consider to be the epitome of a Vietnam helicopter pilot during the war uh, and wanted him to kind of encompass the characteristics and attitudes and bravery that a pilot would go through collectively that, that we all experience to some extent. And so I built him as the main, the center point, and then all the various characters in the book are, are again, they're fictional, but obviously I drew a little bit on different people I met and worked with over really my five years in the Army and my, and my one year there in Vietnam. Uh, the operation itself, which is central to much of the story, which covers about half the book or a little more. The screenplay was to make it cover basically a year. Uh, But about the first half is really heavy into Lamson 719. The second half is basically different operations and and adventures that TJ went through um, before he shipped back home at the end of his year. 
Lomson itself, uh, Lomson 719, was uh, an operation designed by MACB headquarters down in Saigon, which would be, and was the strategy was, game plan was, invade deeply into Laos, cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and wipe out any uh, of the NBA they found and, and all the different caches of supplies and bases they might run into. Uh, and the uh, Americans would provide them with the helicopter support because you if they needed helicopters. They wouldn't be able to do this without the, the helicopter support. So the Americans were tasked with that, that aspect. Um, the 101st Airborne, which uh, was responsible for, we had about 650 plus or minus helicopters in our inventory. Uh, Hueys, uh, Cobras, uh, Chinooks, three companies of Chinooks, 16 Chinooks in the company, and uh, and some loaches. And we were augmented uh, about 30 days into this operation, which I'll come back to, by some, about another additional 100, 150 helicopters brought in from other units further south because we were taking such a beating uh, in during this uh, operation. The January and run four months. The game plan was simply to reactivate Kason, which they did, build additional heliports around Kason, which they did, and bring in uh, 22,000 plus South Vietnamese military troops, mostly Rangers, infantry, and a couple Marine units. And their job would be to go to, to attack into Laos, go down a dirt road called Route 9, and parallel on that dirt road to the left was a little river. And they would just follow this road taking on anybody they met with recognized units and and uh, try and destroy the caches of uh, weapons and food and stuff that they might come across. It was believed at the time of, there was a there was a village uh, way out there about 60 miles. It's, I produce when I pronounce it, I usually don't get it right, but something in the neck of Tucum. And it was believed that was a major uh, supply depot. So that was their ultimate objective. And to accomplish this, they decided to go down this road ridge lines and in some cases pretty high mountains and to give them some protection they would set up fire bases down this road every so many um, clicks if you will four or five six miles down the road then they go a little further and set up some more one one on each side these were designed to give them protection on their flanks and help uh, to try and identify where the nva were and they could go out and support them in their uh, in their operation to take them on or destroy their supplies. Well, the operation started actually on February the 1st. The, the South Vietnamese mechanized started down Route 9, and we, being the 101st, uh, launched our first massive uh, helicopter assaults into Laos and set up a couple fire bases on each side of the road. The first one, the two on the right, the first they did, I think, the fire base 30, 31. And then there was two set up on the left. I can't remember their names off the top of my head. But they go out about 10 miles. Those first week went okay. They got these guys in pretty well. I was a Chinook pilot. That's really the big ones. Our job was to bring in the, the building supplies, the uh, the equipment, uh, 105 howitzers, uh, small Jeeps called mules, ammunition, water blivets, uh, building supplies, sandbags, logs, sheet, uh, metal sheets, and so on to help build bunkers. So after the Hueys would insert the troops and they would secure the base, we would come in, our building their base and their perimeter and all those things. And this is the way it was designed to operate the whole time. The, the Hueys assault companies would take in the uh, initial assault with the Arvin. They would secure the place. Then we would come in and we'd bring in on all, all their supplies. And we were tasked with keeping them resupplied because the Chinook uh, is a very powerful helicopter and can bring in several sling loads at a time drop it off. It doesn't have to land and let people out or unload. It just drops the stuff off and keeps on flying uh, during this operation. The second week uh, that it, we got into it, things had started to deteriorate pretty rapidly. The North Vietnamese got their forces together and started challenging and attacking the bases we had put in on the first group, the first 10 miles out. And we began uh, the second week inserting uh, troops another 10 miles out, setting up a couple more fire bases on each side of the road. In these cases, uh, we would insert the troops and they'd come under heavy fire just to get these guys in to set up the base, which we really hadn't encountered the first week. But the second week, that, that activity picked up. There wasn't a fire base we tried to set up from that point on that we weren't attacked going in to set it up. I, and then the fire bases we had already set up 
came under attack. So the second week on until the operation ended, every fire base that was set up was attacked continually. Every fire base we went in to set up, we were attacked by a, a, an attritional slugfest for the for the helicopter pilots. So, and I'm going to read some statistics here in a minute to put that in perspective. But it got so bad that they decided to call the operation off after 60 days instead of going an additional 60 days, two months versus four months. They did, we got about halfway out with Firebase, about 30 miles out, and just trying to be able to say they accomplished the mission and took on that to come, it was about 60 miles out. And just, we just flew all, all everything they needed out there, attack troops, not, not supplies, because they were going in, taking over, spend the day, get what they needed and get out so they could simply say they took the town, which which we did, and there was no opposition, and there wasn't anything there really for them to to, uh, to take out. So they already knew uh, that we were coming. Now, on the side to that is uh, none be noticed at the time because flying in and out of these bases, a lot of the pilots, including myself, kept saying, what we're doing, where we're going. Of course, it's not hard to hear Huey or a few helicopters and kind of figure out where they're going, but to know where you're going before you even got there to set something up was a little peculiar. Turns out there was a, the highest level NVA spy was in MACV uh, in Saigon. He was actually a reporter that had access to MACV and other folks. And he he was getting all this information about Lam San 719 and passing it on to the North Vietnamese. Of course, they knew our battle plan, working from those and figuring out their strategies, where they should put their troops. Uh, another perspective, uh, the height of the operation to about 22,000 South Vietnamese forces were inserted into Laos. The North Vietnamese, by the end of the second week, had brought down over 64,000 troops, taking these guys on. So it was over three to one uh, advantage to them. Uh, number two, they brought to bear the heaviest uh, firepower helicopters we, the helicopter pilots, ever experienced flew in Vietnam to be shot at in a hot LZ. Usually it was machine gun fire, RPGs, probably mortar rounds when you got close to the ground with shrapnel flying around, and uh, and a few other things, kind of light, still deadly. But in, in Laos, by the second week, when we go and fight, they were shooting 20 millimeter cannons and 40 millimeter cannons at us. If you think back to the old days of World War II when the pilots would be flying and they get all that German flak way up, those little puffy black clouds, they were shooting stuff. They were shooting that good closer to the ground. Those were really pretty accurate. If any one of those hit you, you were gone. And they were shooting 30, I mean, they were shooting 51 calibers, 50 calibers at us, get down close to the ground. RPGs were flying all over the place. Motor rounds dropping in on us, artillery rounds dropping in on us. And about the, the second month, many of the fire bases, uh, well, all the fire bases were under attack. And some of them that were a little bit on the plateaus that had some flat ground or they were getting in the wire and run over one of these fire bases and uh, taking on the Americans and, of course, the Vietnamese on the ground. So uh, here to the fore, I don't think, and I'm, I'm way out of limb here, but I don't think that we were engaged by tanks uh, before that time. We may have been, but not to the extent that, that we would be in, in this operation. Uh, so they threw the kitchen sink at us uh, during the six the last six weeks of this eight week operation costly it was just here's some here's some figures now keep in mind this is the figures where mcnamara was big on figures everything had to be a, a, fi a number and a percentage and it's hard to peg these real close but there was a little over between 750 and 800 helicopters totally dedicated to Lomson 719 when we stopped and it was officially declared over on uh, april the 6th we had lost 108 of those helicopters. Another 618 of the helicopters we used were classified as battle damaged. 20% of those were so badly damaged they couldn't be flown. We just used them for spare parts. On the two months of the operation, 72 helicopter crewmen were killed, 59 were wounded, and 11 went missing. Just two months. It was the most intense uh, air operation for the Americans of the entire war. It came at the end of the war, basically. At that pull out, we were going to go home. The war was winding down. It already been winding down last year. It was really picking up steam. And uh, here we were fighting the biggest helicopter battle we'd ever fought in the war in 60 days at the end of the war. Now, 
who wants to be as uh, I think it was John Kerry said, the last man to die in Vietnam. Can you imagine getting up every morning, suiting up, getting your weapons, putting them on, putting your chicken plate on, walking out to your helicopter and taking off? And as soon as you flew over that border of Laos, going, we figured we had about a 50-50 chance of coming back at the end of the day. That's how intense it was over there. It was, it was rough. It was rough for everybody. My book, I built around that. I, I chose to write the book through the perspective of a Huey assault pilot because these fellows, I have a whole lot of respect for. They lived on the ground. They flew nap of the earth close to the ground. They were, in a, they were the first guys in to set them up. And then if they were under intense fire, they wouldn't let us Chinooks go in. because. Uh, but if they were under intense fire, the Hueys were charged with getting them whatever supplies they could in and getting them wounded out. It's not to say as a Chinook pilot, we didn't uh, do our share. That's the right word. Uh, we did. We went in a lot. I went in many times under very uh, hot LZ conditions. Uh, an intense uh, feeling to be going down into that, and seeing everything blowing up around you, fire coming up at you, green tracers, red tracers, and powder puff. We call them powder puffs every once in a while. I understand the trap flying. So uh, <clears throat> it was rough. It was a tough uh, 60 days. I tried to capture that in the book, and I wanted people to feel uh tj's uh fear if you will his emotions his uh his thoughts uh, what he saw coming at him and what he put up with as, as a pilot down there and then uh the rest of the book after that all ended uh like sapper attacks bases in vietnam would periodically be hit by sappers these were basically one of the suicide bombers the north vietnamese come in with satchel charges and sneak into the perimeters of fire bases and stuff and and, and try and blow things up with big satchels of explosives. I put I put an episode like that in the book to give people flavor. Uh, night missions. We flew a lot of night missions and went into. We inserted uh, uh, LERPs, long range reconnaissance patrols, into the, out concentrations of troops, and then they call in uh, the Air Force doing arc lights. Those big B-52s dropping bombs down on a, basically a large area called a grid square. So I I built a. Uh, uh, everything I could think of that helicopter pilots uh, were subjected to or required to do, I wanted uh, to put in the book and I uh, pretty much accomplished that. So Mr. Uh, the, our main character, TJ, he, he experiences it quite a bit. And I think I pretty well captured uh, what I intended to do, and that was put the reader in the sea of the, of the unit. I wanted the reader to identify with TJ and then just think they were TJ and go through the book. And when you got to the end of the book, you just put it down and you go, oh my goodness, I think I just did a tour in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot. <laughs> and a lot <laughs> and a lot of yeah. people have told me that. So I, I feel mission accomplished there. Right. Now, I, I might have missed it, but you chose the word chariots in the yeah. sky. Um, why did you choose the word chariots to represent? That's a good question. The helicopter. Uh, it, it was a different title at the time, but uh, my publisher and some of the editors said, Larry, pachyderms just doesn't grab me. Some people don't even know what it is. They said, why don't you come up with something else? I said, OK. In my book, there's a there's somewhere well into the book. I, I have a, one of the characters say, OK, guys, let's go out and get in our chariots. we got to get into the sky. I like that. So I ran it by them and then they tested it. And everybody gets that's really good. Basically, uh, when you think about it, you go back a couple thousand years and, and you got the Greeks, you got the Romans, you got the Egyptians. They all used chariots and chariots were a weapon of war. And they uh, gave the the individual, the units that had them an advantage over the troops on the ground. And they could get in quick, they could get out quick, they could bring some people in, they could uh, be a firing platform by throwing their spears or, or shooting their blades off their, off their wheels. They could run through a bunch of troops and cut them up pretty bad. So I thought, man, that that you know, hill, our hill, our Hughes were basically chariots. We took guys in, brought them out. We were firing platforms. We could rain down death on them from different, from different methods, if you will. So that's pretty much how I got it, uh, how I came up with that. It has a nice ring to it, I think. Yeah, it it, it definitely has a great. Uh, well, it gives you a great perspective, um, and and uh, yeah, there's there's definitely a connection, for sure. Um, we're about ready to, uh, to wrap up and I just, uh, the last thing I wanted to kind of touch base, um, on is veterans that 
were in Vietnam, what do you think they will get out of the book? Do you think the book will be any type of trigger for some? And what can they take away from the book uh, from a positive standpoint? And, uh, you know, we, we don't we don't want to um, damage or further, you know, uh, have them experience any kind of uh, uh, breakdowns or triggers when they read the book. But uh, from a positive standpoint, what what do you want the reader to get uh, to empower them and to keep them strong in today's uh, in today's time? Well, I uh, based on the reviews I've got part of your question, uh, I've had a lot of the ones that have gotten back to me almost to a has uh, been very positive about it. In many cases, they relate to some of the characters or the experiences. I've had a few to tell me that they got into it and it, it was so intense for them that they had to just put it down, but they thought it was a great effort. Um, and uh, I've had uh, a lot of feedback from folks who are not veterans who weren't there who said I had no idea, gave me a whole new appreciation, Vietnam veteran in general and the pilots in specifics. They, I always heard about the helicopters, it's iconic door, but I just had no idea what you what you men went through uh, in flying those things as pilots and crew members. And that was my general goal. I wanted, I wrote the book more for the general public to give them a better appreciation of, of what the helicopter pilots and the, our veterans of that war did. Uh, because there's, um, get in a helicopter as a pilot and an air crew person and go up and do what we did on a daily basis. Uh, so I wanted to honor those men that did that and uh, give them credit for that. So that's what I tried to do. I believe I've done that, but it does uh, it does affect some people who've been there. Uh, it, it, all of them who've been there that have reached out to me have related to it. Uh, I've, I've really not at this point, hopefully I don't, but I've not had anyone to be upset with me about it. And they really appreciate that getting out there. That, Hopefully it would. It's a lot of them, and many of them said that sharing it with their family gave their family a better perspective of what they did because they hadn't been able to really talk about it. So it's in that regard, that was a little bit of a surprise to me. But you know, I guess that's a natural extension of that. So uh, right, yeah. Well, I that was pretty. I think cool. I think sharing, you know, sharing your story, and, and to speak for so many, uh, and to be able to share your experience and to let the general uh, general public or or the civilian population understand the magnitude of that operation and what mm -hmm. uh, what our men and women uh, went through over there uh, is 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 just you know kind of in, invaluable. It, I think it's really important that the that story was told. Um, what I really want my listeners to get from our interview today with you is the fact that you survived it and you have went on to do many other things. Uh, you are a strong advocate for the veterans uh, today and you survived and you are stronger for that experience. You have a, uh, a level of relatability and uh, it is possible for our veterans to go through uh, those types of experiences and become stronger men and women for those experiences. And you are uh, you are a testament to uh, to all the men and women that have served in our military. And, uh, you know, you you've went on to do just, you know, amazing things. Um, you're. You're a little bit older than I am, um, uh, you know, and, and my oldest brother uh, did serve in Vietnam uh, as well. And I know that his stories and uh, he doesn't talk a lot about it, but I know that uh, it, it created a different man in him than what he would have been without that experience. So, uh you know, that's for that. I, I thank you. And I thank you for sharing it with my with my uh, listeners for sure. Um, yeah. Um, do you have any uh, closing statements here? And we're fixing to wrap it up and uh, and just go ahead and share any uh, last thoughts that you may have. 
Well, I appreciate you again having me on and uh, giving me this opportunity and your comments. So. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, folks, we are going to wrap anyone's up. Anyone's interested? This. Well, go ahead. Say that. Say it again. I was going to say, if they wanted to uh, get a copy of the book, they could go to my website, LarryFreeland.com, lowercase, and just hit buy the book, and it'll bring up five places, Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon, Cabo, BAM, and IndieBound. Now, you can also order through your local bookstore if you uh, frequent a, a bookstore in your, in your area. Perfect. Yeah, I was going to touch base uh, on that as well. Uh, the the link to Larry's website will be in the show notes and you can connect with Larry through social media there as well. Uh, reach out to him, get a copy of the book, either the the uh, Kindle version or the uh, the paperback. And um, I don't do you plan on turning it into an audio book? Because I think it would make a really great audio book as well. Uh, we've talked about that. Uh, there's a little bit more expense to that. We wanted to see. It's doing real well on Amazon, and it's starting to get what I well, what they call legs on the books. I'd seriously look at converting it to an or convert, uh, coming up with an audio book also as an option. Okay, great. I have a I have a resource that I'll share with you off uh, off the air uh, for you to maybe uh, get that accomplished. Uh, okay. With with little to no uh, financial commitment on your part, so I do have a resource I can share that. Um, share that with you and we'll do that off air but uh yeah once again we've been talking with larry freeland he is the author of the book chariots in the sky he is a, a retired uh, retired helicopter pilot and uh, retired vietnam uh, vet and uh, his story is uh, intriguing inspiring and uh, really thought-provoking and uh, it's just it's 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 an intense story so I would encourage you to, to get a copy of the book, connect with Larry online. Uh, you can click on the link that'll be in the show notes. And uh, it's it's been great having you on the podcast. So um, thanks again. Uh, just stay right, with I me really and you, you bet. Stay with me. We're going to talk, uh, talk off air. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this episode, episode 59. And we have been speaking with Larry Freeland, author of the book, Chariots in the Sky. Um, great, uh, great conversation, Larry. Thank you. And just stay with me and we'll talk off air. I'll end the way I always do. Um, take care of yourself, love your little me and remember that little person inside of you needs you more than you can imagine. So until next time, uh, and we have another episode in a couple of weeks, love yourself and make sure you just come back uh, to the podcast for another episode of the Men on a Mission podcast. I've been your host, Brad Richard, and bye for now. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might and the army was rolling along. Now of all we have done fighting till the battle's won and the army was rolling along. And it's high, high day, the army's on its way. Oh